We're live. We're live. Hey, what's up? What's up? Happy Friday to all. Great, uh, great turnout off the top. Thanks for joining everybody. Happy Friday. We got Rusty as always. Jersey Red, thank you so much for holding down the comment section. I appreciate it. Jeff Steen, what's up, my friend? Happy Friday. Jay, as always, good to see you, Jay. A. Uh, Danny Ryan, good evening, good evening. Scott Blanche, what's up? M.A. from Tacoma, what's going on? Russ, back from vacation, ready to rock. Love it. Scott, what's going on? Jake99, what's up? Uh, Terry, hello, hello. Uh, who else we got here? Mark B., turning the amp on. First tip of the night. <laughs> We're going to go with the electric guitar tonight. However, if you have, if you only have an acoustic, that's totally okay. Most of these things, um, pretty close to all of these things uh, that we're going to go through tonight are uh, transferable to the acoustic and hopefully we'll still get some value out of hanging out tonight. Okay. Although this is a, a little more of an electric, so a little more lead kind of stuff here and there a little bit. All right. Steve Langford, what's up, my friend? Steven NH, what's up? Peter, good day. Gerald from Ottawa. Hello, Terry from sun sunny Florida. What's up? Jeff, what's going on? Going good tonight. Ray, uh, welcome back. Good to be back. Love it. Elias, as always. What's up, Zane? Uh, as always on Friday. Uh, thanks so much for showing up uh, consistently. Everybody, you know, the regulars who are here every Friday, appreciate it. Uh, that's awesome. Chris Cook, good day. <laughs> Saturday already in Perth. Hope it's going good. Jim Gregory, what's up? <laughs> I'm honored that this is the best part of the week. I am honored. Uh, um, oh, man, I'm going to mangle this name. What's up? Shitties, I think. Shitties uh, uh, means. Man, I hope I didn't screw that up so badly, but welcome. I appreciate it. John, what's going on? Good to see you on here on Making It On Friday. Fatih, what's up? Good to see you. Rad Flying V, as always. Thanks for joining. Uh, Theodora, what's up? And uh, Sterling Performance from Charleston, South Carolina. Love it. Jody One, as always. Good to see you. All right. Ozman, what's happening? Welcome on Fridays. Uh, it's going great. Listen, uh, for those of you that don't know, for those of you joining for the first time, uh, we go through some musical examples. I have some tabs for you. So expand the description below the video, download the PDF, print it out, put it on a different screen, whatever you need to do to follow along. Okay. Uh, MA, at least you're not the only one of the Floyd Rose tonight. I love it. See, uh, my friend Dave is doing uh, Wednesdays, right? Mr. salantano has got one of these bad boys, although he's got the uh, tricked out one, a little bit different than this, but we're rocking the Floyds. I felt like rocking it this week. The killer acts, right? So there you go. Uh, yeah, I had to follow in uh, Dave's footsteps. <laughs> uh, Gerald, I do not see any downloads for tabs. So if you click on the description below the video and just go down a, a couple paragraphs, you will see, get the tabs here. And there should be a link to the tabs. Yes, this is an EVH uh, special, Wolfgang special. This one, uh, I've talked about it before. It's been a while since I've had it on here, but it's a sassafras body. So it was a special edition. Uh, Dave's, Dave has got the uh, stealth version of this, which has a few, uh, it's got the kill switch and uh, it's pretty sweet as it is. I think it has the ebony fingerboard. Uh, Nikki the dog is always great to see you. All right. Yeah, John, you know what we're talking about with the sassafras, right? John's rocking the, uh, I believe you've got the sassafras Charvel, don't you? Maybe that's not sassafras. It is. There we go. I knew it, John. I knew it was coming. All right. Uh, usually do some sort of a warm-up, uh, you know, a good all-around warm-up. You know, I've done a million variations of these. If you go back in the streams over the last couple of years, uh, all four fingers. <laughs> doing that kind of thing just to warm it up. Uh, I've started to veer away from, you know, kind of going through the endless variations of those. Tian, welcome. What's up? Um, 
So I uh, figured we'd kind of take the opportunity to just do some simple scale patterns, okay? Um, at least something that you can kind of use if you're going to warm up on something over and over for a couple of minutes just to get working. So so we, we in exercise one of the PDF, we've got, we're starting with the A minor, okay, in the fifth position, as it turns out, right? And then in exercise 1B, we're going to go to the relative major of that. You guys have heard this phrase before, relative major. And I'll go over what it means in a little bit. But we're going to also play C major in this position. You'll notice something about that. And what's this? We got uh, Nikki the dog starting to work on the leads in Highway Song. Hey, man. <laughs> Welcome to a never ending. Uh, I mean, that's probably what, a three and a half minute section of nonstop soloing? <laughs> I worked my butt off getting that down. And even then it's, it's, uh, it's debatable whether I did justice to the original uh, recording on that, but we're talking about uh, highway song, which is on guitar tricks, uh, a little bit of a free bird type of song with a huge solo at the end. And uh, man, thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> it takes a lot of work to get that whole thing down. Right? So there we go. All right, Doug, what's up from Denver? Welcome, welcome, as always. Okay, so back to the warm-up here. We're just going to pick A minor at first, starting in the fifth position. Okay, these are three note per, uh, this are, these are not three note per, st per strings. Starts out three notes per strings, but there's one string that has two. Uh, I suggest alternate picking anytime you're working on scales, okay? Doesn't matter what the scales are, I recommend down, up, down, up, down, up, all the way through. And even better if it's a scale like this that sort of mixes up. Like sometimes you've got three notes on a string, sometimes you've got two notes on a string. What it'll do, that'll do is turn around your picking, depend, you know, going to the next string. You might go to the next string on an upstroke instead of a downstroke, right? So that's really valuable training. So I would just say go slow and just really make sure that you're doing down, up, down, up, down, up. Also, once you get it under your fingers and you know where your fingers are going for this pattern, work with a metronome, work with a steady time reference. Maybe it's a drum groove. Maybe you've got a special pedal, the trio that does it like a drum groove or, you know, that kind of thing. Laura, what's up? Join us when you get there. Please drive safe. <laughs> All right. So uh, we're starting on five, seven, and eight on the low string. Also the same notes on the, a, uh, on the low string and then also on the A string, right? Okay. Then five and seven on the D. And then we go into some different shapes. We're going to have to come down one fret here, four, five, and seven on the G string. Okay. So this is just sort of a, a really simple position shift where you want to be a little bit fluid on the fretboard. Just a little bit of a shift right there to get your index finger on the fourth fret. Okay? And then we come right back on the B string, one more fret up, back to five, six, and eight. And then five and seven. And then eight, seven, five, back down. You can end it off right there with a little bit of vibrato, right? So if I was to do this, uh, try and be steady timing as best I can. Kind of fretted out the note there at the end. I wanted to ring that out a little bit with some vibrato, right? So, Terry, that's exactly what that is. That that last note, we have a little bit of squiggly notation there. What that means is I'm going to apply some vibrato to the note. Okay? So what I'm doing is just pushing up the note just a little bit so you can hear the pitch change just a bit. Check out my wrist. You see it's a little twist of the wrist there, and I'm pushing up. I'm using my thumb for support on the top and just twisting that wrist, okay? For those of you that are working on vibrato, this is sort of the basic technique for it. What you're doing is, is emulating like a singer. If a singer did a held note, um, usually, I mean, not always, but typically, is, I guess is what I should say, they will add vibrato. They'll waver that note to give it a little bit of expression, right? So that's all we're doing there. So what I recommend is going really slow at first if you're new to this. 
and just get used to that kind of, okay? And eventually, once you get used to kind of that motion, you can speed it up a little bit, okay? It's just a little bit of a bend on the note and then bringing it back down and then just repeating that kind of. Sometimes you like a slow vibrato like that, other times a faster one. It, it's just meant to be a form of expression. It's a great way to sort of put a personal expression onto what you're doing on the guitar. All right. Uh, I'm just going to go off on just a little bit of a tangent right now, just talking about practicing scales, okay? And uh, a lot of my one-on-one -on -one students, which is a few of you on here right now, know this already, that we're, when uh, what I recommend you do when you practice scales, um, for example, this example ends on the high A note, okay? So it ends on a root. Okay? So always starting and ending on a root when you're practicing a scale, not necessarily when you're using a scale to improvise or using a scale to come up with licks. That's a separate thing. I'm just talking about when you're practicing a scale, okay? For any number of reasons, we're practicing it to build in picking, to work on our timing, and also just to memorize a scale. But the other important thing that we're doing is we're trying to hear the sound of the scale. And you can only truly hear the flavor and the sound of the scale if you start and end on the roots, okay? Because if you don't do that, you're actually going to be hearing something else. You might hear like a mode, modal thing or something different, okay? Because all different types of scales are related in a way that it could be many different things. So um, I just want you to, to tell yourself, okay, I'm practicing A minor, right now okay so relate all of the sound of that sequence of notes to the roots start and end on those so another thing uh, i would recommend you do and i didn't tab it out here because i ended up top but also bring it back down okay and where you started that's another good thing to do is come back down and then i recommend you hit all of the notes, uh, sorry, all of the root notes in the pattern at the end, just to reinforce it. So for example, in this position of the fretboard, we've got an A that we started on, fifth fret, fret of the low string, the octave, seventh fret of the D string, and then another octave on top of that, fifth fret of the high string. Those are the three A notes within this particular positional pattern on the fretboard, right? So I would that add that to the end of going up and down the scale just to... Okay. Ryan Durst, thanks for joining. Love it. Okay, so not only are you reinforcing the sound of that root, but you're also burning in on the fretboard where those root notes are. Those are anchor port points for you that are super useful and getting to know the fretboard and, and being able to come up with things, you need to have sort of a home base, an anchor point. So the roots of the scale always work great as an anchor point. You know, whether you're transposing the scale somewhere else or playing some sort of a motif that uh, you can play in other octaves, if you know where those root notes are, it's very powerful, very worthwhile, okay? So just one more time through this first scale. I know I'm talking a lot. Sort of the way I recommend it. Now, what's up? What's up, Larry Foster? What's going on? Uh, and Doug's got a question for practicing scales. Uh, what scales uh, should we practice? I try to practice the pentatonic scales, the blue scales, and the diatonics. Getting into modes, should it all be practiced? Here's what you need to know cold. And this, I tell all my one-on-one -on -one students this, tell you guys this from time to time. Full diatonic major scale full diatonic minor scale, okay, major scale, minor scale, and then the pentatonic major and minor scales. Those four scales, okay, pretty much cover 90 to 95% of anything you'll ever do, okay? Now, there are, other, there are other scales. The blue scale is a great one, okay? 
what I like about learning those four scales is that all the other modes, all the other scales are just little variations of those four. For example, uh, Doug brought up the blue scale. Okay. What is the blue scale? The blue scale is an additional note added to the pentatonic minor scale. So if you know the pentatonic minor scale cold, oh yeah, the blue scale is just adding a flat five. So that goes. Okay, then boom, you can pivot to that. You can get to that a lot quicker than treating it as like some foreign brand new scale, right? No, it isn't. The blues scale is just a pentatonic minor with an extra note added. That's it. A lot of the modes, right? You can think of them in terms of, in terms of a major or minor scale with a certain note shifted, okay? But if you know those original scales cold, it's relatively easy. It's a lot easier to think of those scales and just shift a note than it is to like, okay, now I have to practice five patterns of mixolydian, right? Like, uh, you know, if I know those scales cold, I can kind of work with it on the fly a little bit and get used to it and do it a little bit quicker. My opinion, right? Okay. So long-winded answer to a simple question, what scale should I practice? You can practice any of those, but make sure that you have cold, diatonic major, diatonic minor, pentatonic major, pentatonic minor. You got those four nailed down cold. You can practice any of the scales after that, right? But you need to have those cold, down cold, okay? All right, exercise 1B. We're getting into C major, which is the relative major of A minor, right? What this means is that they share the exact same notes, okay? So the relative major and the relative minor, okay, as far as the keys that you're in, right, those are key signatures, they share the exact same notes, okay? So if you look at the similarity uh, similarities between 1A and 1B, you'll see it. Now... I've got the exact same pattern, except I'm starting on C. I'm starting on the eighth fret of the low string instead of the fifth fret, okay? That's gonna sound different in the sequence of how the notes come together. You recognize that sound. That's the do, re, mi major scale sound, right? You're not gonna get that if you go, I'm playing C major, but I start on A. You're gonna get A minor right? Which is why it's so important when you're practicing your scales, when you're learning your scales, when you're trying to memorize your scales, always make sure that you're starting and ending on the roots, okay? So, exact same notes as A minor, okay? But we started on C, ended on C. Now, let's find the C's in this area of the fretboard. So eighth fret of the low string where we started. In the middle, we're at the fifth fret of the, of the G string. And the upper octave, eighth fret of the high string. Highlight those, okay? Get those straight. Does it make sense? Are you with me? <laughs> All right, Alonzo, welcome, welcome. Craig B., good day. What's up in Melbourne? Excellent. Okay. Uh, let's go on to exercise two, shall we? All right. So uh, here's the thing, right? This is uh, before I go on, seemingly like straight ahead thing, right? Like I just spent almost 20 minutes on the first exercise, which is straightforward. We're just playing a major scale and then a minor scale. But there's so much more to think about. There's so much more to get straight in the beginning that no one really tells you. They just say, you just say learn these, right? But there's lots of things you can be doing to warm up with these. Working on your timing, working on your picking. We're working on where those root notes are. What's the relationship in a you know, relative major minor relationship? All those kind of things are really worthwhile to kind of just stop for a sec and think about and try to get it. All right, exercise two, an arpeggiated riff, okay? So <coughs> let's take uh, the upper part of some bar chord shapes here. 
And uh, let's, uh, I'll play through this first and then we'll talk about the chords here. This is exercise two, by the way, if you're joining uh, right now, uh, please uh, expand the description below the video, okay? Expand the description, you'll see a link to a PDF uh, for the tabs, okay? That's what we're going through. Uh, Terry, thanks, I appreciate that. And Jim, all right, thank you. Yeah, there's a lot here, right? So I urge you not, you know, I say this most, uh, most weeks. Uh, I don't know if I have the last couple of weeks. The idea behind these things is to not just blow through the example and say, okay, I did it next kind of thing. Try to spend some time with it and also try to experiment with it. Try to take away what it, you know, whatever the approach is, whatever the technique is, whatever sort of what the idea behind what the exercise is and move it to different keys, try different string sets, try, you know, try different stuff with it. See if you can turn one, one exercise into 10 different things that you can use, right? That's my challenge uh, to everybody, right? All right, get, let, back to exercise two. I promise I'll stop trying to talk so much, all right? All right, so uh, here's, the, here's, here's the idea, exercise two, just some arpeggiation. <laughs> All right, that's what we're going for there. Maybe played a little bit cleaner than, than what I just did, but uh, let's get to the meat of it. Basically, arpeggiating the upper part of this is a uh, root six major bar chord, but we're just using the top four strings. Okay, and uh, this is for B flat, so it's in the sixth position, right? Just a B flat major. Now, check out. Um, you know, as I always sort of give a caveat when we're doing the finger picking or that kind of thing, um, these markings for the picking are just a suggestion. Okay. It's just sort of the way I would pick it. But uh, if you have a more natural way of picking these notes and letting them ring out, there's no right, right or wrong. It's just whether or not what's the most comfortable for you to get it across nicely. Okay. Um, so I gave some, just some examples here where you see that usually what I'll do is I'll anticipate the change in direction of the picking by switching to an upstroke or a downstroke, right? Like I start down and then on the last one going up, I'll switch to the up, then back down, then up, up, down, up. So I'll anticipate the change in direction on the picking with whatever direction it's going to go to. And that feels the most natural to me. Okay, a little bit slower. Now, what's cool, check this out. So you've got, we're, we're picking eighth notes. And if you don't know that, you can look at the notes in the bar. And first of all, there's eight of them, but also there's the one flag connecting every two notes. So the one flag, the one stem or, or the flag tells you that it's eighth notes. And so if you count them up, there's eight notes in this bar so they have to be eighth notes right it has to add up to um uh in four four time if we have eight notes those are eighth notes right so um there's a lot of different ways to arpeggiate this right like if i just went up and down the chord i sort of ha i have one extra beat that i have to account for right so So I'd have to come back up for one more pick at the end of that to make eight notes if I wanted to do that. If, if you didn't want to do that, you could just go. And then let the, the, the last note be a quarter note, let it ring out and then change to the next chord, right? What I like about this particular arpeggiation pattern is that it's a little more interesting, right? It kind of, it start, it, it goes up, it comes back, it goes up, it comes back, right? So that gives it a little more texture. Really nice. And it works out great for all eighth notes in one bar. Uh, John, we're playing, sorry, B flat major bar chord root six. Okay, so that's just our major bar chord with the root on the low string. 
And so, okay, F from the f from the fourth string all the way up, we're just playing those same notes that would be in the bar chord. Okay. Uh, all right. So from there, we're going to an F chord. We're playing kind of a different shape. We're playing out of the caged C shape. If you can imagine the C open C moved up so that the F note is the root and you'd have to bar down on the fifth fret. Okay. And we just play from the D string up. That's your shape right there. So it's actually the major third is the lowest note in this chord, but this is an F major chord. So Roman, the, the, in this particular chord voicing, the lowest note that we're gonna pick is the major third. It's not the F note, okay? But the F note would be where, where my pinky is, eighth fret of the A string, but we're not picking that one. So it's just sort of an upper inversion of an F chord. All right, come down to the third position and we're gonna bar down on the third fret and I'm getting the fifth fret of the D, fifth fret of the B. Now that's the upper part. I'm starting on the fifth of the chord, but that's the upper part of what would be a C7 if you started with the C note, third fret of the A string. Dominant seventh bar chord with the root on the fifth string. But once again, I'm just picking from the D string up. Okay, and then ending off on the F. That's the exact same shape as we started with, with B flat, but it's down in the first position. So that's referencing the F major bar chord there. Okay. Anyone can guess what key we're in? Does anybody know what key example two is in? I'll just play it one more time here. All right, anyone else? Roman says E flat, but MA says F and Russ says F. F is the correct one, okay? B flat, good try. Nikki the dog, good try. That would be a good guess. You know, we start with that chord, but here's here's uh, one of the tricks that is that usually will tell you what key you're in. If you look at the chord progression and there's a dominant seventh chord in the chord progression, okay? if there's just one of them, right? So if you have some major chords and then you have a dominant seventh chord, usually, okay, typically, almost like very often, okay, the, the dominant seventh chord is the five chord, okay? This is very common, okay? So if you start with that knowledge as a shortcut and you look at that and you go, okay, if I make C7 the five chord, then you go back to fundamentals, right? And go Magic L, Lisa's Fundamentals. And work backwards. The four would be B flat and the one would be F, okay? So the key of F is the correct key. That's the one chord, okay? B flat is the four chord and the five chord, dominant seventh chord, okay? <laughs> Roman doesn't want any shortcuts, okay? Then you have Roman, then you're telling me that you understand the harmonization of the major scale to create the chord set in any major key. Okay. Cause that's the no shortcut way. And that's great. You should understand that at some point. I'm just like giving you a real quick little check to see. Okay. What's up, James. I appreciate you joining. What's up, man. All right. Exercise three, burning it head to a little bit of a uh, shuffly bluesy kind of groove playing off uh, open chords and bar chords. Uh, it's a cool little, little idea here. And notice we've got eighth note strums here. As you can see, uh, we've got four groups of two strums tied together with a flag. So that tells you um, we've got eighth notes and one of those is held. One of those strums is held so that we don't strum uh, the one underneath it. Uh, Doug's asking a question pertaining to the previous example. Will the key of the song be emphasized more than the other chords and notes as well? 
I think what, what you're asking me, I think, is would that F chord be emphasized more than the other chords? I think. And uh, that's not necessarily the case, other than to say that usually try to see if you can hear the one chord as being home. And if you think of that previous example with that in mind, if you, if you think about the, the F chord and think, does this sound like I'm going home, if I'm coming home when I play it, usually that will, that's sort of a hallmark of that, okay, I will say. But it's not always the case, right? Sweet Home Alabama, for example, it's kind of tough to know exactly what key you're in exactly because the chord progression, you know. <laughs> A lot of people get fooled into thinking that uh, that the D chord is the key of the song, right? We're, a lot of people get fooled into thinking D is the one chord and that we're in the key of D, but actually it's not. We're in the key of G in that in that song, okay? Yes. Yes, if it resolves nicely, then that's another way to think of, you know, you're coming home to that one chord, all right? Mark B, to the, the key, to me, the key of a progression explains not only the root, but what the third and fifth will be and why they sound right. Exactly. So I didn't go into a lot of detail, but I sort of alluded to the dominant seventh chord being the five chord, right? But if you know your harmonization of the major keys and you know what chords are involved in a major key, you know that the one, four, and five are major, right? And the two, three, and six are minor, right? And the seven is a diminished, okay? You know that in a major key. And there's a certain order to it. So that's how you analyze a chord progression to see which key it is. You sort of have to look at the chords and see what fits that sort of formula, right? And so absolutely, Mark, you know, you've got some major chords, you've got some minor chords, and you have a, a diminished chord in there. And then when you get into seventh chords, it gets a little more uh, complex, but it's basically that idea, okay? Doug, is Sweet Home Alabama Dorian? No, uh, Sweet Home Alabama is uh, G major pentatonic, G major-ish, okay? Because you got five, four, one all sort of major chords, okay? All right, good questions, everybody. Appreciate it, love it. Exercise three, back in the blues groove. So first of all, we're gonna have a shuffle here. So I've got down ups. Instead of one and two and three and four and, right? Straight time, we've got shuffle. The bounce. Okay. So let's look at the first four strums. The first two are a down up on the E chord. But look at the, the third strum, which is the second down stroke. I'm adding my pinky to the second fret of the B string onto the chord. Okay. One more time. And then on the upstroke stroke, I'm going back to the open chord. So just for that one downstroke. Okay, now after that upstroke, back on the E chord, I'm gonna let that ring over the next, what would be the downstroke. And that's why those notes are tied. You see those uh, arcs connecting all the notes in the chord over the next beat. That means don't strum. That means let it ring out over that, so. Okay, and then I've got an upstroke back on the E chord, but then the next one, I'm just gonna sort of bar down with my ring finger down on the second fret to the B string. Notice I'm not moving my, uh, my index and middle finger off the chord. I'm just sort of flattening the ring finger. And that makes it really quick to get back to the E chord with the open strings underneath it. Does that make sense? So that bar put together,
Okay. It's actually coming out of a, a Rolling Stone song that uh, I'm going to be teaching for Guitar Tricks filming in the next couple of weeks. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, so different ideas on how to embellish on the E chord in a bluesy way. That's sort of uh, similar to what you know. What, You notice it, you know, this rhythm, you're going from the fifth to the sixth. You're doing the exact same thing up on the B string. That's the fifth to the sixth. So you could just do that pinky move back and forth. That sounds really good. But, but I think for the second strum, he comes down and he sort of gets the whole A chord going. So it's, it's like you're adding an A chord, just move into the four chord for that one strum. Okay. Makes sense. <clears throat> I think it's kind of a cool part and it could be fun to uh, mess around with that strum pattern, right? Scott says, I just started the intermediate acoustic lessons on guitar tricks. Andrew shows that bar. Glad I've been practicing it. Yes, absolutely. Cool. <clears throat> awesome, man. All right. So what if we took that strum and applied it to a uh, bar chord? In this case, going to the four chord, which would be A. A major, okay? And this time, because we're sort of, our fingers are in, are in a different configuration here for the, for the A major chord, you're gonna have to bar down with the pinky. Like we can't just add the pinky. You could do that, you could add the pinky to this, but you're, you're sort of letting go of the D string, which would turn this into a dominant seventh chord which is a variation, which is cool. But if I wanted to keep it straight A major, I have to have my pinky on the D string, right? So I can just press, sort of move the pinky to flatten it on the D, G, and B string. It's sort of the same strum, but we're doing that move twice, so. idea and of course you can expand this to a 12 bar blues and bring it up <laughs> all right laura you made it safe i'm glad you made it safe uh yes cheers to cheers to everybody. it's friday night right get a get a goblet of water going all right exercise four Got to do some triads, right? <clears throat> so uh, we've got a couple different examples of triads. This first one basically sticks with major triads on the D, G, and B, D, G, and B strings. Okay? So we've got second fret of the D, G, and B. That's an A major triad. You'll recognize the notes out of a full A major chord, right? But if you just played those three notes that still spells a full A major. You got the three notes that make A major. Hence, we have a triad, three note chord. Now, very common move is to hold that down and add the fourth fret of the D, third fret of the B. That gives you a D triad. And this is a, uh, the first inversion because uh, remember the F chord pre from the, uh, two exercises ago. Um, this is the, sort of the same shape on the D, G, and B string. And we've got the major third as the lowest note, right? So let's look at the strums. Let's see what we got. Okay, so two quarter notes. One, two, three, and. Very common, up to speed. Uh, right. Now I'm gonna do the exact same thing up in the seventh fret in the second bar, barring down in the seventh fret, 
and doing those same shapes. So put that together. Third bar going back to the second fret, same shapes. Last bar, I'm going to grab fifth fret of the D, fourth fret of the G, third fret of the B. That comes from your G major bar chord, but just the D, G, and B string. That gives you a G chord, G triad. Going to a D triad, that same shape we had in previous bars. Okay. So the whole riff together. Kind of stonesy, right? Very common kind of rock and roll kind of approach. But what you're learning here are just some different uh, inversions of those triads, okay? Because this is a D, but then this is also a D. This is a G, but this is also a G, okay? So there we go. Cool. All right, so what you see there are two quarter notes, uh, sort of the same strum in the first three uh, bars, two quarter notes and then two eighth notes. <clears throat> so one, two, three, and, right? One and two and three and four and. That's what we got going on. I like playing that with all down strokes, but you can get into up strokes if you want. Like that. Okay. Cool, cool. Yes, Jesus just left Chicago, right? What is it? Bora. Don't know what key it's in. I can't remember if it's in G or if it's in C, if it starts in C. It might be C. Right? <laughs> it is in G, right? So. <laughs> it's in A. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, I don't know what key it is, but uh, there you go. I'll leave that. Laura's got the blues driver set up. So there you go. Rock it out. Excellent. <laughs> cool. Okay, so that's your first set of triads. So some major triads on the D, G, and B string set. Uh, let's go up to exercise 4B, and I'll play through it, and we'll work through this. Same strums, I think. Okay, so now we're going to focus on some minor shapes, but and also move it up to the G, B, B, and E string set, top three strings. Okay, so fifth fret barred down, that gives you an A, main, A minor chord. Okay, and on that third strum, I'm going back down to a G triad. This is the extension of the one on the D, G, and B string. You've actually got sort of the same shape on the top three strings. Fourth fret of the G, third fret of the top two. Okay, so. Right? Next shape for E minor, this is the root five E minor chord. If you know that bar chord, which is basically the B minor up in seventh position. Okay, top three notes of that. G, B, and E strings spell uh, another minor triad up there. So if I just go, I'm just moving those shape that shape down for one strum and then back up. But in the third bar, now I'm in a position where I can get to the next A minor shape. Ninth fret of the G, 10th fret of the B, 8th fret of the high string. Okay, so we got A minor here as well, going to G, which looks like a D transplanted up, right? 
back up to the A minor, which would be a D minor transplanted up, right? So these shapes are movable if, you, if you're not concerned about open strings, right? If we're just doing all fretted notes, them into any key, right? And then again, E minor to D minor using the A minor shape, just barring down with one finger, 12th fret to the 10th fret, back to the 12th fret. Top three strings, right? Great stuff, I hope. Triads, well worth your time, right? Okay, exercise five. Let's get into some bending exercises, okay? Couple things here in exercise five. Okay, this thing called unison bending. By the way, some of you may be new to bending, okay? So we'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, but this is a case where we're going to bend one of the strings and play the note on another string that we're bending the first note up to. So, for example, in exercise five, the first one is the ninth fret of the G bending up a full step, okay? So this is an E note. I'm going up to an F sharp. But I'm also combining an F sharp that is fretted already on the B string, seventh fret. So this helps to have a little bit, you know, Laura, it's good you got the blues driver, a little bit of overdrive, a little bit of distortion will help you hear when it's in tune and when it's a little out, right? If I overshoot it, you'll hear it kind of wobble. This is called beating, right? Like kind of wobbles a little bit. Like. And you hear it kind of slow down when you zero in on the note. So, so bending up to avoid the B string? No, in this case, we're doing unison bends, okay? Which means we want that note in there. It's just a, it's a sound, okay? Sounds cool, right? Okay, that, that's what's called a unison bend. We're bending up one note. We're bending uh, one of the strings to get to the note. And it, on the other string, we're already fretting the note, so... Okay, so it turns out on the G string and the B string, a unison bend are two frets apart, right? On the uh, high string, for example, um, they're three frets apart. It's just a sound, right? And you can kind of get expressive with it, like you hear when I go slow. It kind of adds a little bit of that tension as it's getting into tune with, with the other note, right? And you can kind of add a little bit of vibrato if you want to on the top of that bend. Okay. So remember with bending, okay? Like we're gonna be holding a note here and then we're gonna bend with the ring finger in this particular example. So you want your middle finger sco uh, scooched right up to your ring finger to help you push that up. And you see where my thumb is. That doesn't always necessarily have to be there. I can have the thumb back here if I want to, but I find that if I can get my thumb around there, it makes it a little bit easier. Okay? So if you get it around the top of the fretboard, it gives you some leverage, right? Okay? So just something to practice with experiment with the expressiveness of going slow and going fast. And also the next exercise is about figuring out how to get it in tune. Okay. And so what I've done is spaced out the notes. So now these are no more, they're not unison bends. The, the, it is a reference note and then a bend. And I'm trying to match. I'm trying to re listen really hard to the sound of that target note. And so when I bend, I'm trying to use my ear to hear getting it, getting it to the same note. This is how you practice bending, okay? You want to be able to practice this to get it in tune. So if I'm bending a full step on the G string, 
each pick your target note, which is two frets down on the B string, and then bend up so you're matching matching that pitch. In this case, because I'm only using the G string, I've got all three fingers helping me push that up, scooched in, right? You hear that kind of idea if you do it fast, right? Okay, that could be like, uh, you know, sort of a improvisational solo idea, right? In this case, I'm just, you know, giving you a way to practice getting your bends in more, you know, more in tune, right? Once you bend up, hold it there and see if you can match that note. Hold it, okay? Once you start getting it in there, practice a little bit of vibrato on that, okay? Might be a little a step too far right now, but just take it one little step at a time, all right? Okay, let's see. Uh, yes, Terry, definitely uh, train kept a rolling kind of stuff. Right? That kind of thing? Or where would it be? I think Train Kept a Rolling does it. They're different notes. It's not necessarily a unison bend. That's when you put your pinky down on the 15th fret and bend up the 14 on the G. Okay? That gives you the uh, Train Kept a Rolling sound. Okay. Uh, Doug, my bending needs work. Any tips as to where to bend? Yeah, just work on, on these kind of exercises. The first thing you got to do is just get your fingers, as many fingers as you can, behind the note you're trying to bend. And you have to be, uh, you know, pick exactly what you're going to bend. Like if it's a full step, then you're going to bend two frets up, right? That's another way to do it is just go a full step is two frets up. Come back down. Try to match it. If it's one, a half step, that's one fret up. Okay. So there you go. Uh, sweet and sour. Thanks so much. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, ex so exercise six. Uh, some riffing you might uh, recognize, mostly single note, a few uh, double stops at the end of the second example. Uh, using mostly A minor pentatonic. Okay. Uh, first one's got a little bit of syncopation. Whoops. Come on now. One more time. Okay. Got some eighth notes here. And we're going to let one, that last note, third fret of the A string, ring out for a bit. And then it's back to eighth notes. Okay. So you're sort of like, uh, um, it's sort of a little bit, disjointed because you're not starting that next phrase on the top of the next bar. It's sort of happening at the end of the first bar. One and two and three and four. Okay, so four and you're coming back in. And uh, another example here. So those were all sort of eighth notes with some syncopation and some held notes. And then we get on to uh, exercise six. Yes. And we know this is Kansas, right? Uh, exercise six, where we get into 16th notes. So I advise you start slowly on this. Okay, this is from the bridge section, right? Okay, so starting with an eighth note, and then those are all 
16th notes until th those last two, th those go back to eighth notes. Then there's some rests and it stays on the ands. Uh, whoops. Okay, sliding in on the seventh fret of the D and G, that gives you uh, sort of the upper part of a power chord, D and then C, power chord, okay, on the fifth fret. And then you repeat it and there's a different ending. That's why we got that number two there. Oh, uh, whoops. All right. So, uh, you know, mostly A minor pentatonic there. There's a few notes that kind of are outside that. So it's actually sort of Dorian a little bit. I think we were asking about Dorian earlier. Won't get into that. Okay, we're running out of time. But, uh, hey, cool syncopated riffs to play around with, right? Exercise seven, uh, just some interesting chord shapes into a progression here with a really common rhythm. Okay, we're still strumming some eighth notes here but we're gonna ring out some uh, root notes and then play the upper parts of the chord. So the first one is actually sort of a uh, interesting A chord. So the first thing I'm doing is barring down on the second fret from the D string all the way up and then adding the fourth fret of the G. And right there, if I don't even add the top string, you hear the sound of it's an A major, but I'm adding an extra note in there, which is the, the nine, the add nine, adding a B note onto an A chord. Really cool sound. And then with my pinky, I'm getting the A note, the higher octave A note up top on the, on the fifth fret of the high string. Okay, so. Strum, root, root, strum, root, root, Strum root. So this kind of a rhythm, really common. Um, pop, rock, other genres, right? So if I speed it up a little bit, okay. Uh, second bar. You're going to get the second fret of the low string. I'm going to curl my finger to mute the A string and then grab the second fret of the D and G string. And then I've got the open high string. Okay. Another really cool floaty kind of chord. This is an F, F sharp minor seventh and add 11. Really cool. Okay. Then I'm going to go to a D chord um, in the fifth position, right? But I'm going to bar down on the fifth fret on the top and curl my finger at the seventh fret of the G to allow the fifth fret of the B and high uh, E string. And that E note gives you an add nine. Well, it actually ends up replacing the third, so it's actually a sus two in this case. D sus two, another floaty chord, great. And then back to the open E. And then just with your pinky second fret of the G string to give it the sus four. Play it one more time here. Cool. Just trying to show you some uh, cool voicings on some, uh, you know, sort of straight ahead chords, right? To make them a little hipper. All right. Uh, for, for you lead guys, last couple uh, exercises here. <laughs> Uh, we're going to work on some hammer-ons, some pull-offs, uh, that kind of stuff. All right, so uh, I'm going to play through exercise eight. Uh, this is in A major, and it's just this riff that I kind of uh, actually comes from a song I did in a band a long time ago, but it's, it's kind of a cool exercise for pull-offs and picking dexterity. Uh, it goes like this. Uh,
See if I can do it a little faster. <laughs> Okay, so uh, it's a cool little pattern here where we're picking. Okay, uh, open A string, second fret, fourth fret, we're picking all of that and then picking the open D string, picking the second fret of the D string, but then pulling off and then coming back four and two on the A. Okay. Playing that twice. Now I'm just going to move up a little bit and add it onto the open strings. And it sounds pretty weird because you're doubling the D note. You've got a fretted D note at the fifth fret, but you've also got it on the open string. So it kind of gives a cool flavor to it. Okay. Next one is five and seven on the A and then six on the D string. So that gives a different kind of thing. And then I'm just gonna come down. And then my final chord is the fourth fret of the D, seventh fret of the G. That actually sort of just an abbreviated double stop that outlines a D major chord. Okay, but that last one, you do the pull off, right? You fretted note, one pick, pull off, and then another pick on the open string, and then pick it up on another note. So. I thought that'd be a really cool exercise at the very least. Uh, it's definitely kind of a weird <laughs> riff. I like weird riffs. And uh, finally, D major, three notes per string. Uh, this is uh, a legato exercise, which means you're gonna pick only once per string. This is a three note per string pattern. Okay, uh, three note per string, uh, D major. And I'm doing groups of three, so I'm actually, when I get up to the B string, I'm gonna come back to the G string and start again. And then at the end, whoops, I'm going to slide up. I'm not picking any of this. I'm going to slide up to 12, pull off to 10, pull off to 9, hammer on to 10 with vibrato. Okay, so if I put the whole thing together. Whoop. That's the idea with that one. Let's see. Ah. <laughs> That's what I'm going for. <laughs> Ended on a close enough note. <laughs> I got to practice more, guys. I hope you found it uh, useful tonight. All right, everybody, uh, thanks so much. Had a great turnout tonight. Great stuff in the comments. I appreciate all your comments, all your questions, and I appreciate you showing up each and every week. We'll be back on acoustic next week. I think it's, uh, is it finger picking or is it, I think it's finger picking next week. We'll get back on the acoustic, okay? All right, well, I hope you have a great weekend. I guess we're uh, gonna fall back an hour, at least uh, in the US. I'm not sure how it is the rest of the world, right? <clears throat> thanks so much i appreciate it yes laura we'll see you tuesday one-on-one -on -one. i love it excellent all right everybody thanks so much i know we went over a little bit but uh appreciate the kind words the engagement all that kind of stuff uh have a great week all right <laughs> have a great weekend great week we'll see you week ciao everybody cheers <laughs>